Morning, church. Go ahead and turn your Bibles. That is Exodus 1. We'll start our Genesis study in Exodus. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Exodus 1, starting in verse 1. So as you turn in your Bibles, um, if you knew it or not, this is our first week in our new study. And so this new study um, that we have titled The Grain in Egypt um, is a study to the life of Joseph. And so in that being said, I want to encourage you, I want to take a second before we jump into God's Word and, and read through it and really start to dive into probably about two and a half months to three months together in Genesis. I want to encourage you to really drop an anchor and commit to this study. And so if you're new to this church, we have been doing this for a handful of years, you know, seven to ten years about where we will camp out in a Bible, in, in a book of the Bible, and we will just go through it, not missing a word, a syllable, a comma, and we will teach through all of it. And so we've gone through Exodus, we've gone through Matthew, we've gone through about 18 books of the Bible so far in my ten years here at East View. And so we're not going to be going through all of Genesis, but we're going to be going through a pretty good chunk of it. And so there's a few things that I want to just kind of turn your attention to and and encourage you in before we start. And number one is to commit. And so it's very hard to read a chapter of a book and a second chapter of a book and come back and read the fifth chapter of the book with really understanding. And so right now, if you are here and maybe you're visiting or maybe you're starting to visit more and you're starting to become consistent, I really encourage you to continue to be faithful in being present. I want you to really drop an anchor, come, be ready, have those highlighters, have your Bibles, really um, be accountable to God's Word and learning it well by being under strong godly teaching of it. And so not everybody is able to come to every week. You get sick and we have babies and we have moments where we're out of town and all of those things that happen. And in the midst of all of that, just continue to be faithful in listening. It will bless you. I can promise you that. Number two, know that Nikki and others that work on our social media site and then also our website, I write a devotion every single week. We try our best to put it out on like Wednesday or Thursday. And so you can go through Facebook. You can go right to our website and you will be able to see the scripture that we're in. And you'll also kind of have an idea of where I will be. And so I will tell you, learning God's word is not as hard as a lot of us have made it. When you are plugged into a church and you fall under godly teaching, just knowing where the pastor will be and reading the verses, even if you don't fully grasp them at first, just having digested them and then sitting under teaching will bless you immensely. And so I encourage you, be a part of that devotion. Know where we will be. Read the scripture beforehand. Pray over it. Understand where I will be. And I promise you being present And then being ready will grow your heart and your mind in God's word more than you can believe. And then lastly, we're going to pray over our our service here in one second. Just know, I don't announce this enough, but I get a lot of questions about it. Um, I preach through the New King James Version. And so I, I don't announce that enough. And a lot of you guys are coming and you have a lot of different Bibles and versions. And there's a lot of versions that I that I love. Um, Some that I don't, and a lot that I do. And so I preach, you know, almost mainly out of the New King James. And and so if you're coming here and you want to follow along word for word, and sometimes having a different translation trips you up, um, this is what I preach through here. I think it's a great medium between a lot of um, interpretations that that I respect. And so if you would would like a Bible, if you don't have a Bible, we have one for you. Find me after the service. But we're going to pray here for the three months that we're going to be in. Pray that God saves and that God enlightens and God grows in our time in the story and life of Joseph. So let's bow our heads together. God, we thank you for today. It blessed me seeing the rooms filled in Sunday school, seeing my brother Brad under the pavilion with all the adults and the kids running the hallways and such phenomenal music to sing together and, and the emotions already stirred up, and the affections that are obvious. Lord, I thank you for your church. Life is busy. And in this room, we have a mix of emotions. We have people that are on highs and people that are in lows. That's what the family is. In different walks of life at different times of life. And so in this moment, Lord, no matter where our people are, Lord, I pray that you press pause on all of our thoughts and our busyness and our emotions and distractions and let us just be glued to your word. 
Your word is greater than our desires. Your word is greater than our sorrows. Your word is greater than our worldly highs. Your word is all that we need. So in this moment, press pause and remove all distractions, all stresses, all worries, even all excitement of the world. Press pause on all of it. And let us feast our eyes and our attention on you. So, Lord, give me the words. Remove all agendas, all thoughts, all opinions from my mouth, Lord. Let let us make very little of us and very much of you. Let you get all the glory in our three months of this study. Thank you for all the people that put time in the website and preparing this for our people. Continue to fill this space with your people and your precious and in your, your holy name. In the name of God, our Father, and Jesus, his Son, our Savior, the church says... Amen. Amen. So look at Exodus 1. We're going to start off in Exodus before we jump in to Genesis and what is seen to be an inverted narrative of how you can teach. And so what I mean by that is, I don't know if you've ever seen a movie or read a book where really the first chapter is the end of the movie, right? And so you'll see a show and it's kind of the end of how it all you know, concludes and then it goes a flashback to show you where it began. That's what we're going to be doing here this morning. And so as before we start, I'm very aware because I sit with many of you guys that God's word can be overwhelming at times. As my brother Travis sits with young people trying to make it not as complex and to enlighten them on understanding God's word from Chad and Ashley sitting with our younger ones. And then even me with you, I sit with so many and people go, Hunter, I've been in church my whole life, but man, this is so overwhelming to me. Well, here's the good news. It's not as overwhelming as many of us believe it to be. And so this morning, what we're going to see is we start off in God's word we're going to see how quickly God's word tightens and how quickly like our, our sense of being overwhelmed by this big book with a lot of names we have a hard time pronouncing shrinkens. And so we're going to start the story of Joseph and really the story of Moses. And listen to Exodus 1, 1 through 14. Have those highlighters ready. Be ready to work no matter how old you are. It blessed me yesterday. Somebody texted me and said, Hunter, not only did I buy a Bible for the first time, but I I bought a pack of highlighters, and that blessed me. (laughs) So so be ready to work. Look at God's Word in Exodus 1, 1 through 14. Now these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Will you highlight that? Right off the bat. Now, these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man in his household came from Jacob. Jacob was the father. Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah and Iskar and Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan, Nephiti, Gad and Asher, all those who were descendants of Jacob were 70 people. For Joseph, highlight this, it's a big point. For Joseph was already in Egypt. And Joseph died and all of his brothers and all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty. And the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look at the people of the children of Israel and look and see. Notice that they are more and mightier than we are. Come and let us deal with them shrewdly and let them multiply. At least they multiply and it happened in the event of war that they also may join our enemies and fight against us and so go up to the land. Therefore, they set test masters over them and afflict them with burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply and sidium cities. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiply and grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. They made them slaves. Verse 14. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and brick and the manner of service in the field and all their service in which they had made them serve the king with rigor and exhaust. And so what we see in Exodus 1 is this beginning, kind of the conclusion of the story of Joseph. There's a moment where 
The people of Israel were in Egypt, and as they grew in numbers, it made the Pharaoh at the time, you remember for the people that were here during our Exodus study, between the waters, the Pharaoh at that time was a new Pharaoh and king. He wasn't a fan or knew Joseph or his people. And he looked at the people of God grow in numbers, and he says, this cannot be good because if they grow so mighty, they might overtake us. They're in our land, but our land might be their land. And so they put them into slavery, right? They said, we can't have this. And so I was thinking about this, this story of Exodus and Moses and the moment of Joseph and Jacob and his brothers and how it all intertwines. And I thought of that theory, you might have heard of it, of the butterfly effect. You ever heard of that theory before, that concept? It's basically the theory that something very, very small can have large impacts, not even knowing that it's having an impact. Something as small as a butterfly flapping its wings and the small amount of wind that's created by one little butterfly can really change the course of creation. You ever heard something like that? So as simple as you bending down and tying your shoes might prevent a red light being green and might prevent a wreck or you having coffee with somebody and saying something or not saying something. The fact that I could preach 30 seconds longer than expected or 30 seconds fewer than expected could change history. That's the butterfly effect. And so I don't believe in this theory because that's a secular man-made theory. I believe that God is sovereign over all things and you tying your shoe is not going to change the course of your path. I believe that God is not in heaven on the defense. He's not up there crossing his fingers that Marcus makes the right decision today. God is not in heaven with every eye, you know, a pot on every eye, just hoping to make sure that he doesn't overcook our food. Like, that's not what God is doing. So I don't believe that butterflies can change human history However, I do believe that small decisions and choices and life decisions can change and make a huge impact for your life. I do believe that. And so I do believe that everything matters. If you even look at the Bible and you look at this world, the truth is the fall of Adam and Eve, just these simple two people taking a bite of a fruit would lead to war today. If you look at the mess in, in our world and all of the things that are going on from destruction and, and poverty and racism and death and sickness and divorce and the fall of all. If you look at all of the mess that we are in and you start tracing it down and tightening and tightening and tightening, it all begins with what? A simple bite. I believe addiction started with a sip. I believe that an affair started with a flirt. I believe for my parents and my young ones, I believe that the opportunity to let your kids shut a door with someone that they might be dating would lead years later to having awkward conversations about virginity lost. I believe that small choices and small decisions can have huge impact on our lives. Just take a second and think about it. But I also believe it on the positive side, not all negative. I believe that your kids hopefully will be impacted by all that you bless them with. I told you before, my love language, I love to travel and I like to travel big. Like I like those experiences. But I truly believe that this morning my kids will be impacted more about me bringing them to church than me ever taking them to Disney. I believe that my boys might grow up and know how to treat a woman by the simplicity of me going every single day to buy her a Sonic drink. And you go, that's not going to change their history or their future about how to treat a woman. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. I don't know. I believe that everything matters, church. I believe that every decision matters, every choice matters, every commitment matters, every word spoken and every word not spoken. I believe that every yes matters and every no matters. I believe that everything we do, it might be heavy on you, but it doesn't mean that it's not true. I believe that everything that we do has probably a larger impact than you realize. Much larger. And that is the story of Joseph. If you look at Exodus and you look at the story of Joseph in Genesis, 
this huge story of slavery and destruction and wandering the wilderness in this journey to the promised land, you start tracing it down and down and down and down. It starts with small decisions. In Exodus 1, the book of Ex- in, the, in chapter 1 of the book of Exodus, it starts with the people of God, Israel, being in slavery. They were in slavery, church, for 400 years. The Bible says a million people and a death toll of who knows how many. Do you remember the book of Exodus in chapters 1 and 2 when the Pharaoh got really, really scared to death? What did he do? He says, hey, listen, we got to make their life hard. But they kept growing, so what did he do next? He says, well, we're going to do population control. If anybody during that time of the Israelites, if they have a child and it is a male, do what with them? Throw them in the water. That's how you got to make sure that we don't overpopulate these people, Right? And so remember the study in Exodus. I asked that question, and it says it in Exodus 1. I understand that they were in slavery. I understand the situation. I understand the mind of Pharaoh and the hardships on Moses. But why were they there in the first place? Like, why were the people of Israel, hang with me, if you were here two years ago, you remember me asking this. Why were the people of Israel, why were the Israelites in Egypt to be in slavery in the first place? Hundreds of miles away. You go, hundreds of miles away might not be that far, Hunter. Back then on camel, that's weeks to months of travel. To be honest with you, these people, a million folks in hardship for 400 years. Now in the wilderness, The majority of the Old Testament never should have been there in the first place. That is not their land. So why were they? Well, the Scripture tightens. The Scripture tightens. You remember I told you to highlight. Now, these were the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. And Joseph was in Egypt already. So look at God's word in Genesis 42. The Bible is not as complex. Millions of people, we're going to see it shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink to a very simple story. Look at Genesis 42. See how Scripture tightens. Look at Genesis 42, verses 1 through 2. I like both of them. Now, when Jacob, Jacob is the father of Joseph. When Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his boys, said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, indeed, I have heard that there's grain in Egypt. So go there to that place and buy for us there that we may live and not die. So why were the people of God in Egypt to be enslaved in the first place? Very simple answer, necessity. There was a famine. And so here's another question. Let's keep digging. Why did they stay? Like I go to Walmart almost daily, but I don't set up camp there, right? Like if the people were starving and they left their homeland to go to Egypt to get food, why in the world did they stay? Well, most of you know the story of Joseph, the VBS story that we've learned since we were a little kid. It's a very simple answer. They had family there. And we're going to un- unveil it later on and we're going to dive more into it as we get deeper into the story. But what did the brothers find in Egypt? Not only grain to live, but they found their brother They found family. Some of you guys can relate to this. One thing that I'm not used to, I'm not from Huntington, but I'm not from California, but every single week that we come into this church, we have visitors, and and I say, where are you from? And they're from Minnesota and California, New York, and all of these places, and why are you here? And they're like, well, taxes and, you know, mallards. That's the reason I'm here. And you go, you don't know anybody? And they'll say, what? I got a few cousins about 45 minutes away. Same story. Why did the people of God find themselves in Egypt? Necessity, famine, they needed food. Well, why did they stay? Well, they had family there. Hang with me, church. If you're a note taker, kids. 
Well, why did they have family there? Why did they have family in Egypt? And that is where our story begins. And so look at the first chapter of the story of Joseph. That is where we begin. So look at Genesis chapter 37. This is how my mind works. Like, I love studies like this. I can sit at my desk and just go for hours. Like, I love digging and digging and digging and just seeing the, in the midst of Exodus and seeing them out there and how many people there were in 400 years and all of the turmoil and going, how do they, how do they get here and why are they here? And then just titans and titans and titans and titans. And so listen to how our story begins in Genesis 37. It says, Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was, a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers and was laid with one of the sons of Belial and the sons of Ziplah and the father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to his father. And some of your Bibles, when the the Hebrew interpretation of this was like he went and tattled, okay? And now Israel loved Joseph. Israel is Joseph. Now Joseph loved, Jacob loved, I'm sorry, Jacob. Now Jacob loved Joseph more than all of his other children because he was the son of his old age. And also he made him a tunic of many colors. Some of your Bibles say coat. But when his brothers saw that their fathers loved him more than all of his other brothers, they hated him and could not peaceably talk to him. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. Will you highlight that? Highlight verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more for it. So he said to them, please hear me and hear me of this dream in which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf rose and also stood upright. Indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams than for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream. They told his brothers once again and said, Look, I've dreamed another one. And at this time, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars bowed down to me. Later in sermons, we're going to unpack all of that. And so he said to his father and to his brothers and to his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed, son? Shall your mother and I, your brothers indeed, come and bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in his mind. Verse 12. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers feeding the flock? Come, and I will send you with them. And so he said to him, Here I am. And he said, Please go and see that it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks, and bring back word to me. So he sent him out to the valley of Hebron Hebron, and went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him, and there he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What are you seeking? So he said, I am seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, They have departed from here. I have heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. And Joseph went to his brothers and found them in that place. And now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near, they conspired to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Not my brother. This dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say some wild beast had devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams at this point. But Reuben Reuben heard it and he delivered him out of the hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into the pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might be delivered him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. Highlight 23 and 24, and then we'll stop. 
So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Jonas, Joseph of his tunic and tunic of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit and the pit was empty for there was no water in it. So church, see how quickly the scriptures tighten. Hundreds of years of slavery of the people of God. The hardships and deaths of hundreds of thousands. Years of wandering the desert. Trace it back, trace it back, trace it back. All to the conflict of one home. Slavery of a million. Where did it begin? The conflict of one family. The story of Joseph is very much the biblical view of the butterfly effect of what goes on in one home can affect many more people outside of that place. For generations, for decades, what happened in Genesis 37 would impact people that these men would never meet in their life. Can you see it today? Like, can you look at this world and all of the mess that we are in and all that we are experiencing and trace it back to something so simple? If you look at this world, and as I said earlier, devastation and poverty, racism, war, death, sickness. If you start tracing all of the problems, this world to our country, to our state, to our town, you start narrowing it down. Something so hard of like, how did we get here? Start tracing it back, church. And what do you see? You see the family. You see the home. One family in the midst of conflict and jealousy and anger and heartache and a murderous, envious, jealous spirit led to what? A million people wandering the wilderness. God gave a simple command, do not eat of the fruit. Now look. Two folks. Do not eat of the fruit. Now look. The same formula with the family. Now look, God's design for the home is not complicated. It is very simple. God creates man. Man needs woman. Guess what God gives him? Woman. God gives the the image and the covenant of marriage as a godly ceremony. I say this at every wedding. Just like Christmas or Easter, marriage is for Christians. If you go back to the origin of what marriage is, it is God's love for the church. This is his bride. And so marriage is a covenant between man and woman who stands before not just simply each other, but God Almighty and promises that I will live my life together. Why? Because we are now the image bearers of his love for the church and then gives them sex. And what is sex? Sex is a blessing. It is the wedding gift of our Lord, and it is also a means to an end of multiplying. And now what does God say? Now go live and be fruitful and be faithful. Now look. Look at how the destruction of the home has led to the destruction of our country. God's plan has always been through the family. You hear me? Guys, in in, in Exodus, you think Moses in the midst of all of that hardship out of all of those people when he was leading them through the desert, you think he ever said, hey, guys, if we could just figure out the family. No, all he saw was mess. All he saw was destruction. All he saw was, was people complaining and starvation and heartache and conflict and all of these things. And where did it originate from? Conflict in the home. What does your home look like? Guys, here's the truth. We need a lot of things in this country. We need politics to change. Amen? Like, I've never understood that whole, like, you know what? Like, the way I vote is, like, private. It's personal to me. I'm not ashamed to say that I think that this is all jacked up and we need a new man in office. Ask me where I'm voting and I will quickly tell you. We need change. 
This liberal, woke society of we don't know the difference between men and women and all of us are confused, that is not going to work well for us. I don't mind saying it on this stage. However, we need more godly men leading homes than great presidents leading this country. And so we can, look, we can look at this world and go, man, if we just had a different man in office, everything would be okay. No. Because it originates in the home, because that was always God's plan. God's plan was not Washington. God's plan was the family. And so, guys, every year the divorce rate goes up, even within Christians, over 50%. Last year, 43% of children are being raised in fatherless homes. The percentage rate of kids that are experiencing neglect or abuse reported that it was done by loved ones that they consider family is one in four. Guys, we have a lot of things to fix in this country, but at the top of that list is our worship of Lord and our fixing of our families. There's nothing more important. Why? Because that was always God's plan. We talked about this in our sex, sexuality study like six, seven months ago. Just see the simplicity of it. God gave man woman. God gave man woman. And man loves God and finds a woman who loves God. They stand before the Lord and they commit to him as they commit to one another in the midst of family and friends. And then if God blesses and chooses so, they raise children and then they multiply on that foundation. Not complicated, not rocket science. It's very, very elementary. Just step back and just see God's heart and his mind and all of this. It's not hard to understand. But man, look how far we've distorted the simplicity of the home. Man and man going through the same covenant that they were never meant to go through. Amen. Woman and woman. Man thinking that it's woman. Woman thinking that it's man. Sex before marriage. Not believing in man. Like all, you know, unyoked couple. All of these things. And we look at our world and go, man, we got a drug problem. No, we have a home problem. But well, listen to me, family. The home problem was not just simply on one person. Like in the home and when we look at Joseph's situation, like there was enough blame to go around. And so every sermon that I've always heard, man, it's always the brothers. The brothers are the obvious villain, right? But listen to what it says in verse 3 of 37. Look at verse 3. It says, now Jacob, now Israel, loved Joseph more than all of his other children because he was the son of his old age. So what does it say here? It says that there's probably a lot of problems in the home, not just the obvious ones. Scripture tells us that Jacob showed favoritism to Joseph, that Joseph was the son of his old age, and then also historically the Bible tells us it was probably because one of its many reasons is that Joseph was the son of his favorite wife. And who knows? Maybe, maybe Joseph was the smartest kid out of the bunch. Maybe he was the most athletic. Maybe he had dad's face. Or maybe he was just the ultimate daddy's boy. Who knows? But Jacob loved Joseph in a way that all the other brothers knew it. So I want you to think about something. Have you ever felt less than in life? Ever? Ever? You ever felt less than in your own home? Like a lot of us have circles where we go, man, like I'm the last one picked on the kickball team, or maybe I don't know where to sit at lunch, right? Or maybe I don't fit in with that group, or maybe we don't fit into that group. A lot of people have some type of story. But have you ever been less than in your own family? says that, the jo that Jacob loved Joseph in a way that it wasn't just kind of like thought or theory of maybe we're not the favorite, but the brothers knew it. So if you believe it or not, it might not be true, it might not be accurate, but if you talk to kids, all of us feel like, oh, I know who dad's favorite is, right? To all of you guys. 
Like, I know who the favorite is. I used to joke with Liam all the time because I was always harder on my boys and my girls. And to be honest with you, I'm okay with it. And Lila was the baby. And there'd always be moments where I was very hard on my boys. And there'd be times, that, like today, like Lila would get away with it. And I'll look in my rear view in the car and Liam would be like, what? You know? He's like, why are you letting him get away? You would have taken my soul from me. Like, how do you let her get away with this? And I always joke. I go, I mean, buddy, she's my favorite. I don't know what to tell you, right? <laughs> she's not my favorite. But, but you ever felt that way in your own home? He said these brothers felt less than by their dad. But don't overlook the sins of Joseph, the innocent victim. Jo- <clears throat> Joseph has always painted this picture of this wonderful golden child, but don't overlook the sins of Joseph. Like, how would you feel if you were the half-brother of the golden child who always took the opportunity to be by dead side, to tattle and to tell, and then also to unwisely, potentially, pridefully, and if it wasn't pridefully, it was a lack of humility, to make sure he gathered everybody around to let you know the dreams that he was dreaming. So just think about this moment. You're the golden child and God has blessed you honestly with these God-given blessings and abilities and you gather all your people around and go, man, let me just explain to you what is about to happen. Guys, who is the villain? Who's sinless in this situation? Like, I'm not promoting murder, but I don't blame them for wanting him gone. Some of you guys have lived your whole life in the shadow of your brothers and sisters. You ever felt that? Like I'm the middle child and there's only two of us. You ever felt it? And for my parents, here's the truth, guys. Even though God's formula for the family is very simple, it doesn't mean the home is easy to manage. Amen? (laughs) I'm trying my best in failing. In this simple home that led to the slavery of a million, we have favoritism. We have a lack of wisdom We have the sadness of death that they've experienced. We have pride and a lack of humility. We have resentment. We have anger. What's under your roof this morning? Hey, let's press pause in a minute. Let's just think. What if somebody's writing your book? The book of Travis, right? Hey, what sermon are they preaching? The book of David and the book of Hunter, the book of Brad. Like, hey... And people are sitting around going, oh, man, what did I just say to you? In this simple home, we have favoritism, a lack of wisdom, a lack of humility, pride, resentment, anger, frustration, a murderous heart. Like, what's under your roof? Do you think these people saw it? They recognized it? They understood the destruction that was happening? And then it takes us to the perfection of God, our Father, and the fact that there is no favoritism in the kingdom of heaven. That in the midst of my sin, the fact that I'm not the most athletic and I'm not the smartest guy and I have failed over and over and over and over and over. I'm the ultimate middle child. God loves me just as much. In the light of Easter, if it was just me on this earth, God would have sent his son just for me. Just for you. And so I might live on earth in the shadow of others, but I do not live in heaven in the shadow of anybody. Here's the truth, guys. On earth, it's so easy for what is seen as simple feelings in the home or words that are said or justifiable actions to lead to major problems. We've experienced this in our families. These brothers, these 12 brothers had justifiable emotions. But understand, their justifiable emotions overpowered the calling of God. And that is to what? Love our brother. Like, if I was the brother of Joseph, I wouldn't be a fan either. But God called me to love him well. That is what we should do, is to love him well. Guys, see how it tightens. See how it tightens. See how it tightens. Their resentment and jealousy led to anger, which led to action, which led to slavery. You hear me? Their jealousy led to resentment led to action, which led to slavery. Some of you guys in this room right now haven't talked to your brother or sister in years. 
There's people in your life you haven't talked to in years. Start tracing it back. Start tracing it back. And you'll see how these big issues and these huge conflicts that have really changed your life, that have changed your history, like butterflies flapping its wings, start in a very simple space of jealousy or resentment or envy or anger. And it builds and it builds and it builds and we don't talk anymore. No matter if it's justified or not, God has called us to love our brother well. The dad was sinful, Joseph was sinful, and the brothers were surely sinful. You know, I shared with you guys last month that I was blessed by going on a trip and out of the country, and God gave us a great opportunity. And in that opportunity, there was many lessons and so we were able to go um, to Spain, and my, my, my youngest son got this awesome opportunity to do something. But you guys know if you have multiple kids, um, not everything is equal across the board. And so there was this moment, like Joseph and his brothers, I go, London, guess what? 6% of the country, and brother, you're going to Spain. Everybody else, you're going to Grandma's house, right? <laughs> and so it was like, really? And it was like, really? You know, kind of and so there's lessons in that. Because kids, if you have brothers and sisters, eyes on Pastor Hunter for a minute. Let me be a spoiler alert for you. Not everything is equal in life. Life is not everybody goes to Walmart and everybody gets a prize. And so there's this moment where I sit with my kids and go, hey guys, you're still going to school every day and you're going to grandmoms in London, you're going out of the country. And so there's two sermons in that that I had for my kids. I said, hey, London, when God blesses, when opportunities come, when achievements happen, when you, have, when you stand victorious in all of your hard work, be quiet about it. Be quiet about it. The people that need to know, know, and those that don't will quickly find out. I said, buddy, I'm proud of you. I'm thankful for your hard work, but we're not getting on social media. We're not getting on there and go, hey, look at my kid. I'm not doing videos of you playing. Like, we're not doing any of those things. Stay quiet about your victories. Here's a life lesson that all of us need to get, okay? We are not getting on there and going, look at me. My kid is kid of the week. Straight A's. This weekend in the tournament, they went three for four and got MVP. That is not what we are doing. We are not asking for all eyes on me. Buddy, when God blesses, give him the glory and stay humble and quiet. Liam, be loud. London, quiet. Liam, be the loudest cheerleader your brother has. And so there was a moment where it was honestly my proudest moment of the whole experience. And it wasn't uh, going. It wasn't that he was chosen to go. It was not how he played there. It wasn't even him. It wasn't even why I was there. The proudest moment of this experience that God gave me came a week before we even went. And it wasn't even the kid who went. There was a moment where I told Liam London, I go, one reason that we don't post things and we say, look at me, look at me, look at me, because you don't want all these folks looking at you. Because man's heart has a hard time being happy. And so London experienced that. At school, which I'm glad they did, it was very sweet of them, the week before he left, somebody got on the intercom and said, hey, let's congratulate London. He's going on this trip. Good job, buddy. Go have a good time. And then it came. And so my, my son came home and he goes, hey, Dad, I saw what you were talking about. Like People came to me and was like, hey, I just want you to know I'm also supposed to go to Spain, but I was busy that week and I just want you to know that, right? Hey, my baseball team's going to Tokyo next summer. Just know that. Hey, buddy, listen, if you, you and I went one-on-one, -on -one, I bet I could beat you. And he was like, man, all these people just kind of started coming with hate. And here's my proudest moment. My oldest son, someone comes to him and goes, hey, you angry your parents not taking you? He goes, no, I'm all right. And he goes, your brother, little guy, he did that good. Here's my proudest moment. Liam goes, you have no idea. You have no idea. That was my proudest moment. Guys, hang on my words. This is something that God has pressed on my heart for the last three years that is profound and that we need to see. 
The people who love you and support you and are really there for you in life are not always the people that are just down in the trenches with you, but it's those people who root for you when you're not. We have a hard time cheerleading people. We have a hard time rooting for people. Even brothers can't root for brothers. Even sisters can't root for sisters. Like We have a hard time cheerleading other folks. I hate that you're going on vacation because I'm not. I can't stand that you got a promotion because I don't. I hate that you're happy. I hate that your marriage is good. I hate that you're excited about what you're doing or you love your job. I can't stand that you won because I feel like I've lost. So you always heard the, the whole analogy of your real friends are those that are with you when you have nothing. You know what, guys? I, I agree and I understand the, the thought behind it. But man, I think you'll find less people when you're doing good. Man, God put that on my heart about three years ago. I said, Hunter, you don't root for people strong enough. When David goes on vacation, David, go on vacation. Kill it, man. Be happy. And man, your win is my win. And these brothers failed. These brothers saw God blessing Joseph and goes, man, I can't have it. I can't have it. Joseph wasn't quiet about it. Joseph was not humble about it. And his brothers failed because they didn't root him on. Like right now, do you have envy in your heart? As I said, take the roof off your house. Do you have envy? It's a nasty admission, isn't it? Are you jealous? Do you scroll through Facebook and your heart just stirred with anger because you go, man, they look happy. And they're fake pictures on Instagram, right? Do you have that in your heart right now? Are you Jacob who shows favoritism? Are you Joseph who is prideful or lacks humility or wisdom? However you want to frame it. Are you the brothers that just fail to root for one another? The brothers had a hard time cheerleading, church. Had a hard time cheerleading. And it led to anger and it led to resentment and it led to action. And it led to slavery. Let's keep going in 37, verse 25. We'll read the rest of the verses here. He said, so it came to pass. Well, I'm sorry, let's just go ahead and start. Yeah, 25. And they sat down to eat a meal, and then they lifted their eyes, and they looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with the camels bearing spices, balm and myrrh, and on their way to carry them down to Egypt. And so Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Trying his best. Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, he is our flesh, he's trying. And let his brothers listen. Then the Midianite tried, trader passed by, and so his brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelite for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Can you imagine that moment? Can you, this is not on the notes. Can you imagine Joseph looking, going, Wait, what are y'all doing? Have you ever had a moment where you knew my brother doesn't root for me? My sister does not root for me. My sister wants bad for me. My brother wants bad for me. It says in 29, Then Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in there. He was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes, and he returned to his brothers and said, The lad is no more, and I, where shall I go? And they took Joseph's tunic and killed a kid of the goats. And dipped his tunic in blood, and then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you not know whether our, son, our son's tunic is or not? And he recognized it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast, their plan achieved. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. And then Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his waist and mourned for his son for many days. 
And all of his sons and all of his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Highlight verse 36, please. Last verse of the day. Now the Midianites had sold him into Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and a captain of the guard. <clears throat> so as we close this morning, understand that one of the huge themes of Joseph's life that you're going to see every single week is that a slavery of a million began with the fall of one home that started with the bite of one fruit. And so how you live and how you love others has a greater influence and impact than you realize. But the story of Joseph is not just the decades of destruction caused by sin and how our decisions and choices and matters and life impacts more than you realize, but it's also about God's provisions. It's about God's sovereignty. It's about His hands on top of everything we do. The fact that when butterflies flap its wings, it is not going to overpower God's desire for our life. As much as you and I try to mess up things, God will have what He calls His. It will still come to be. And so when we look at Moses, Moses was thrown into the water to die, but he was found by a woman. What woman? The right woman. When you look at Joseph, when he was left for dead and sold into slavery, he was bought by a man. What man? The right man. Guys, hear me as we close. Please stop getting purses together. I said last page of notes and I heard all this ruckus coming on. Chill out for a second. If you stop and look at your life and press pause and take a step back, you can just see destruction in your life. As we looked at all the issues in Joseph's home, you can look at your home and go, oh man, just, you can see it, all the ways that you just tried to mess it all up. But in the midst of your mess, what do you see? You see God's provision. Man, like if I really step back and sit down and take a moment to really look at my life so far, 42 years into this game, I have tried really hard to ruin me. And in the midst of my ruin, I always see God's goodness. The world will throw me into the water and I'll be found by the person that God wants to find me. I'll be thrown into the pit with no water and guess who buys me? The man that God wanted to buy me. And so when we look at the destruction of our life, we can trace it right back to the sin and the fall in the garden. But when we look at God's provisions, we can also change it, narrow it down and trace it back to Jesus' death on the cross. Man in the midst of the death of Christ was trying its absolute hardest and God say, I will, prevail, I will provide a way. As we close, nothing in your life is by coincidence. Nothing in your life is by coincidence. We are called to understand that every choice, every decision matters and has great influence. How you live and how you love greatly matters. But for God and who he calls his, he will provide a way. And so if you are sitting here today and God's word is spoken to you and in the midst of your mess, you see a door that is open and a voice that calls you. Do not stay in your pit. If you are in the pit right now and you go, man, I have really messed this up, but I see a door and I hear a voice. Man, do not stay in your pit. If you sit here today and you are saved and you are having those relationships and you said, I have not cheer led my brother. I have not loved my brother well. I have resentment. I have envy. I have jealousy. I have anger. And it has led to slavery. Man, call them up. Call them up. Love your brother well. And if you are the Josephs, Stay quiet about your victories and let the ones around you love you better. Let's bow our heads. God, we thank you for today. Lord, I just love your word. Thousands of years ago, stories that were in such a different life, I see myself in it. And that is not a coincidence. 
How amazing that we can read words and stories and unveil characters that are going through things in such a different time. And it reflects today. God, this world needs so many things to right the ship, but there is nothing more important than you. And through your way, we see the family. Let us love our children equally. Let us be humble about who we are and let us cheerlead each other. Let us love better than we're loving. Let's cheerlead those around us. Let's root for people when they have been blessed or when they're experiencing high times. Let's cry when they cry, but let's cheerlead when they need it. Let's be happier for those people that God has blessed. God, let's see that nothing in life is a coincidence. That nothing is because a red light turned red when it did or we had coffee at a certain time or a sermon was preached too long or a butterfly flapped its wings. Let us understand that everything has a day and everything has an hour. And if this moment is a moment for for someone in this building where they sit in the midst of their pit and God has provided a way out, God, let them stand Let them stand and let them see that no matter how much we have tried to destroy our life, that your hand is always on it and an invitation always stands. Let no one leave this room still in the midst of their darkness. God, we thank you for all that you do, your people, your cross, the blood that was shed, your son that sacrificed his life. Thank you for the gospel, which is our salvation in your precious name. Amen.